just shout at me if you need me to speak up, but I usually should be quite good at projecting my voice. Um, <laughs> very quickly, I have taken a day holiday from UHI to come here today, so you'll notice that there's no, uh, no um, symbols, no logos on this presentation, and I'm here as a free agent. So <laughs> I, I'm accountable only to myself, which might be quite a dangerous thing. <laughs> For those that don't know me, um, and again, this is just a bit of background to try and um, prelude to what I'm going to say. My research focuses on the socio-economics of the environment, largely based in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, but my research has taken me all across Northern Europe. Um, I'm really interested in anything and everything to do with the Highlands and Islands, um, the, the environment, really people, the people that are here. So my research takes me across net zero, rural, land use change, just transition, repeopling, a lot of renewable energy for example. And I've just picked out a few here that are probably relevant for today. I'm also a director at Community Land Scotland and various other community organisations, but I will stress that these views are very much my own, albeit they're probably informed by these various positions. I'm interested in all of this work for largely kind of a reason on the right. I want to leave this region in a better place than I found it, reflecting that the region I live in today is in a better place than it was for my dad, my mum, my grandparents. So the fact that we have a university, for example, in the region that took me home to study here is fantastic. We, we have lots of good things going for this region, but we do have many challenges. Caithness, for example, where I call home, projecting 20% population loss over the next 20 years. So this is a big motivator of what I do and why I want to do it. Today we're going to talk around net zero, so very quickly, just so we're all on the same wavelength, I'm using Scottish Government's definition here, effectively where greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are balanced by the removal out of the atmosphere. We have a 2045 date in Scotland for net zero. We have various other policies in place for other sectors, industries, that may be before that or after that that are yeah, to get to that 2045 uh, date. So one off the top of my head, for example, we have an aviation region, net zero aviation region, target date for 2040 in the Highlands and Islands. Coupled with that, we can't escape biodiversity. We've heard it today, biodiversity loss, often or uh, frequently incorporated into the net zero debate. Um, and the Scottish Government also is currently consulting on biodiversity um, strategy. And their definition here is around the decline in biodiversity will make the climate crisis worse and a changing climate will increase the rate of biodiversity loss. So they're separate but inexplicably linked. The Scottish Government um, is expected to announce a target to halt biodiversity loss by 2030, reverse it by 2045. So similar time frames we're talking here. Very quickly as a kind of visual aid, the challenge, this is I think 2018, 17, 18, greenhouse gas inventory for Scotland doesn't quite include some of the things we're going to talk about today in terms of peatland, but the challenge is to make sure all of this blue effectively becomes that green. We can cheat a little bit by it, making that green a little bit bigger by increasing carbon sinks, but that's the scale of the challenge. Shrink that down so it fits within the green spit. Maybe make the green bit a little bit bigger. So, first of all, something that's very close to my heart because I live here. Um, we're going to talk about peatlands when it comes to net zero and crofting. We know that crofting areas include large areas of peatlands or peaty soils. Just even looking at this map should showcase it. This is a peatland map from 2016. Somebody can correct me on my dates here. Effectively, the darker pinky purple is good, class 1 peat. Class 2 yellow, you can see crofting counties, a lot of class 1, class 2. Um, we know that these act as important stores of carbon. There's a huge amount of carbon stored in peatland soils, supports biodiversity, and if the bogs are in good condition, it sequesters, it pulls down that carbon. Most important point here is the storage of carbon in the bog, for me anyway. Um, but we do know that across Scotland, 80% of these peatlands are degraded. Um, 
Do we know how much of those degraded peatlands are in the crofting counties? Do we know how much of those degraded peatlands are under the crofting tenure? I think these are some interesting questions. We do know that historic peat cuttings in crofting or land under crofting tenure emit emissions from car or carbon dioxide emissions. And we do know that drainage has been undertaken, particularly on common <coughs> grazings. We know that peatland action and peatland code, two mechanisms to help fund peatland restoration um, or for degraded peatland. We know that crofters have been taking advantage of peatland action, which is the Scottish government's funding £250 million over 10 years um, to be able to restore peatland. We know that crofters are potentially, or crofting communities are potentially interested in selling carbon credits from peatland restoration. That comes through the peatland code, which is administered by the IUCN. Um, and this is where you can effectively sell your carbon <coughs> credits from not emitting, um, not emitting carbon dioxide from degraded bogs. But we know that this is very, we're in the very early stages of this as a nation, or, but also when it comes to the crofting, um, crofting communities. Uh, hands up, in fact, does anybody know any common grazing which is using peatland code to sell carbon credits or will be selling carbon credits in the future? I don't know any. Yeah. Uh, so this could be something on the coming in the future. There's various questions here as to do crofters want to sell those carbon credits or do common grazings want to sell those carbon credits? I know some people um, do. There's maybe questions here around the aggregation of these units into what we call charismatic carbon. So a buyer is, more, is prepared to pay more money for charismatic carbon than normal carbon credits. What is charismatic carbon? It could be from a community owned estate, for example. It could be from a crofting estate. It's carbon with a story behind it, a yeah. good story. So just raising this, that your carbon in crofting communities could be worth a lot more money than, say, carbon uh, credits developed uh, from a, a different landowner. Pick. I've been, last two weeks, uh, looking at the business case for a private landowner who is effectively looking at how they can capitalise for payments for ecosystem services. And much of a significant share of their business case is based on future biodiversity uh, credits. Something akin to carbon credits, but effectively from a biodiversity sense. We're in the nascent uh, early stages of this um, as, a, as a future income source. But if the private sector are looking at it, you know it there's maybe a, a promising a avenue there. Again, we can go back to Scottish Government uh, targets and understand that if the Scottish Government is setting policy around biodiversity, maybe, and they're interested in how the private sector can fund this, there may be private sector uh, credits in place. And we know, of course, that crofting helps contribute to biodiversity. There may also be, and this is, I'll be pe preaching to the converted here, this is not new, but there could be a unique selling point to the produce that you produce as crofters if you can market in a certain way to certain audiences or certain consumers around net zero, for example. And if you have the numbers to back it up, you can prove that your beef or your lamb is net zero. And we can go maybe in the, the discussion around what that actually means. You may have ethical consumers who are willing to pay a much higher price. Again, we're probably in the early stages of this. Uh, in the future, peatland restoration is all around remote sensing. They're not going to put people out onto the bog to be able to, to assess whether the, the peatland restoration is working. It's going to come from satellites. It's going to come from remote sensing. The private sector, again, is taking full advantage of this at the moment. This may offer opportunities for you as crofters and common grazings to be able to look at peatland restoration and reduce that cost or do it on a much bigger scale. And we also know that we will need to undertake a lot of peatland restoration across the crofting counties on land out with crofting tenure. We also know that crofting communities provide population within these areas. Crofting can help support the labour market requirements for future peatland restoration. We know that labour requirements are a limiting factor on peatland restoration now when it comes to um, private states, for example. A few thoughts on selling carbon credits. Uh, for me, I think the price of units will rise. 
Um, you can take that as you will. Don't come um, suing me if they fall. But they may be needed by estates, crofters in the future, for example, and again, this is hypothetical, but might future income or a future subsidy be related to your ability to prove that you're net zero or crofting to enhance biodiversity. So what happens, for example, 20 years time, the government says your subsidy is only for uh, crofters, you're crofting net zero, but back in 2023, you sold all your carbon <coughs> credits to Shell, and that wouldn't happen in this room, of course, I know. You would need to buy back those carbon credits from somebody else, probably at a much higher price. So we're effectively saying at this stage, we, I, be canny with this, and don't go selling all your carbon credit without thinking it through. We also need to ask questions, and this came up in the, the first round of discussion, uh, questions around crofting community and the wider, crof the wider community. Maybe in the past, these were synonymous with each other. Now, they're maybe not. If we're expecting private land owners who are cashing in on selling carbon credits to deliver wider community benefit, should we be asking the crofting community to also deliver wider benefit to the wider community? How might this work in practice? Again, we're in the very, very early stages. This could be a cash sum to the local communities of a share of the profit. It's already happening today with some landowners. It may be uh, directing some of that cash towards targeted, uh, targeted issues around education. It may be around apprenticeships, for example. It's still wide open. When it comes to woodland, we know that woodland and forestry, particularly woodland, vital for climate and biodiversity when it comes to the low, uh, low carbon building material carbon sequestration, increased biodiversity. We know that land under crofting tenure is well placed to contribute to the forestry strategy coming from Scottish Government. We know woodland crofts, please go and speak to Jamie because he's um, well worth speaking to this around woodland crofts, agroforestry opportunities. Crofting communities likewise also provide a sustainable base for populations they could help support labour market labour requirements for an increase in the future forestry sector. The creation of new woodland crofts is a serious opportunity to attract new entrants to the croft to into crofting in new areas and the creation of new crofts as well. People are much happier to see woodland crofts on new crofts than on crofts where previous generations have spent a lot of time and effort improving the ground. Very quickly, many proponents of the sheep wrecked narrative have very different perceptions of the highlands and islands, particularly when it comes to woodland. The map on the left hand and right hand side comes from a group interested in what they call temperate rainforest. This comes from the Guardian. And they potentially see the highlands and islands, crofting counties, as a blank canvas for some of the, these aspects around woodland creation. Crofting tenure provides some protection against green lairdism, against these certain aspects of the environmental movement, uh, looking, at, looking at our land like this. But we do need to understand that there is a shift in public perception right now. 76% of Scottish public support rewilding. It's just the context that we're operating in, and we need to bear that in mind. And we'll go into that a little bit more. Very quickly, because I've been wanting to put this slide together for years, <laughs> net zero is not just around carbon sequestration, it's around energy generation. We know that crofters throughout time have been closely coupled with energy generation, from peat right through to the coal crofters, the Brora, Riona, there with notable mention, the atomic crofters of Caithness, the hydro crofters of the Highlands, and you can't go into any crofting community across <coughs> the region where oil and gas sector does not still support many livelihoods. In fact, I was speaking with a friend recently and she said the only reason she was able to stay in North Sutherland crofting and raise a family was because of the oil and gas sector. We know that renewable energy development will require increased labour force in rural areas, Scotland for example. We know that these are going to be high skilled, high paid <coughs> jobs. We know many of these jobs are going to be a close proximity to resource. For example, in the Murray Firth, SSE operate the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm. They necessitate that their workers live within 30 or 40 miles of WIC, the operations base. 
you need to be in the Highlands to work in that offshore wind farm. This could offer offshore uh, opportunities for a crofting community to support that. Again, fly offshore, fly off home opportunities, much like the existing oil and gas sector. Crofting communities are going to support the renewable energy industry and they already do support the energy industry. We maybe need to be asking questions of the energy industry. How are you going to support crofting communities? Uh, today, we know that crofting communities are custodians of the land and the crofting communities subsidise the rest of Scotland when it comes to ecosystem services. Crofters in North Sutherland, for example, uh, preside or custodians over land which sequesters carbon and that subsidises emissions in places like Glasgow or Edinburgh. This is the mentality we need to be thinking about when we're talking around crofting and net zero. We know we provide, and excuse the language here, but I think it's useful to use it, provisioning services, regulating, supporting cultural services. Sustained populations in these areas of which crofting provides provides the, the, the ability for rural communities to achieve net zero for urban communities. But how do we quantify this contribution to provide an evidence base to policymakers in a quantitative sense and a qualitative sense? Probably we focused or have focused on qualitative aspects over quantitative aspects at the minute. But policymakers, when they're looking at net zero debate, like numbers. <coughs> What's the future requirements going to look like? For me, I would say that we need to be looking at providing these numbers to the, to the policy makers. We need to be looking at natural capital accounting on land under croft and tender. Is it a net sink or a source of carbon? It doesn't really matter if it's a source of carbon. That just gives us the evidence base that we need support to turn it into a sink. If it's a sink, fantastic. We can tell government that crofting communities are, again, supporting us. We can do this on a local level or we can do it on a regional level. We need to understand the uh, carbon stored in peatlands under Croft and Tenure, for example, to be able to say we need the support to keep this carbon in the ground. Again, looking at things like sequestration potential via peatland, woodland, and what scale, uh, what biodiversity is supported and what the scale of potential increases. These are all doable right now if uh, there's money to pay for it. We as a university have been doing this for different, um, different sectors, different organisations. It needs to be done for crofting communities. I need to take a breather. I'm trying to get through this in 20 minutes. It's quick. Um, we also need to underpin these environmental considerations with social, cultural and economic um, considerations of crofting. It's not just all about the environment. Um, policy makers understand the numbers and I'll apologise to all the policy makers in the room for generalising here. Again, they don't have to be perfect, they don't have to be good, they can be good, the bad, the ugly, so long as there's numbers in place. This is one of my very cute dogs uh, on a common grazing in North Sutherland, an area that we now know as the flow country. Threats. <laughs> and just to go back to the historical aspect here, I've put various pictures in. This is my daughter standing on the stones of the house of which her great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, William Mackay, was cleared to before being cleared again to um, a crofting township in the north of Sutherland. This is now owned by a green laird. And I always think it's an interesting juxtaposition of the future that he wants for this landscape compared to the future that I wanted for this landscape and maybe what fits best for the, this generation. So, there's going to be undoubtedly change to payments and supports. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm not the best person to talk about them, but they're coming. We maybe have a lack of understanding of crofting law from some policy makers. I don't think those I've spoken to in the room, this is not criticism levied at them. And the environmental lobby, whatever we want to call that. We also are seeing changing perceptions of land management practices from the public when it comes to particularly sheep and beef, things like peat cutting. Again, peat cutting is a hill I will die on in terms of preserving it um, because I think it's a fantastic cultural practice which has very li uh, limited environmental impact. We still need to restore previous um, peat cuttings, but I don't think we need to impact the future peat cutting. But the public is moving against sheep and beef we need to prove that sheep and beef 
the way that it's been produced in crofting counties is or can be um, better for net zero targets and biodiversity. This is one that needs to be mentioned. The link is maybe slightly tenuous, but the uh, talk around the economic clearance of people driven by ecotourism and living. And we're certainly seeing this in some areas of the North Highlands. And this is largely reflected or can be drawn back to improving the environment and gentrification of the countryside related to improved environmental considerations. Um, and again, this comes into crofting communities, maybe around the neglection of crofts associated with this. The usual uh, perceptions of wildness and core areas of rewilding. The government's just released a new draft MPF4 where crofting comes out very well in wildland policy and it looks like the government's maybe going to retract on wildland policy compared to where they had been. So this is maybe less of an issue, but we still shouldn't shouldn't take our foot off the, the, the pedal when we're fighting back against this. And of course, the reintroduction of species, we know that that has caused issues already with the crofting community, and it's certainly on the agenda, of particularly the rewilding movement, and may cause further issues in the future. I'm conscious of my time, so I'm going to try and get through these very quickly. Um, there's many opportunities in my eyes coming from net zero, increasing recognition of legitimate place of people in landscape. Many in the environmental sector are increasingly seeing the importance of this. Crofting can be or should be or is a very good template for people in nature. New income streams for payments from ecosystem services, biodiversity credits, carbon credits, etc. Increasing value from the products which showcase net zero biodiversity positives. If you've got um, uh, beef uh, cattle on the moor, for example, to help improve biodiversity for conservation, I would pay a hell of a lot more for that uh, beef than I would for other types of beef. <coughs> Increased demand from younger generation, new entrants due to lifestyle. We discussed lifestyle crofting uh, in the previous session. I think this is something that should be considered. Um, maybe the risks and or the opportunities and the risks. There's also going to be peripheralization of new net zero industries, particularly energy generation and associated industries in rural areas. These can also be used to keep young crofters or keep crofters at home rather than having to move away for high skilled, high paid jobs. And again, can we talk as we move to net zero, potentially a reduction in numbers of sheep into increased productivity from crops, horticulture, uh, more polycrypts, for example. Uh, these are some of my own. Uh, one very quick observation, one very quick observation. I was recently sat in a meeting with a very well respected professor of climate science who has moved into a rural community, and he said that he used to think sheep were the absolute enemy to shifting to net zero. He moved into a community, um, yeah, I was wrong on the wrong slide here, but bear with me. He moved into a community, <laughs> he moved into a community where he had to then work with the local farmers and crofters to help deliver land use change. He came to realize the importance of sheep both in an environmental aspect and a cultural vast aspect and he changed his thoughts uh, on the sheep he probably still there's maybe more sheep there than he would like but his attitudes have changed so if you can change the attitude of a professor in climate science by putting them in a crofting or a farming community you can probably do it with most people back to the slide in question for me when moving forward, I would show that the crofting community understands the science. You, the crofting community, is in a far better place to understand the science than uh, the scientists, because scientists are generally sat behind computers in the office. If we had to pay you the going rate as crofters for your observations and your reporting and your understanding of the environment, we bankrupt the university. We could not be able to afford to pay you those rates. This is a huge important value, huge important um, understanding for the scientific community. Um, offer this knowledge to the scientific community, don't take no for an answer, that's maybe the more important thing. Um, look for unexpected allies, whether it's academics like myself. I, I have friends and who like to go hunting and shooting and fishing. And the issue of green lairds, they have said to me, they came and went, 
Magnus, maybe you're onto something with the, this land reform lark because we need to stop these people coming in and buying our land and trying to do this with it, which I thought was fantastic. There's also many what I would call radical ecologists or people within the rewilding movement who are very much allies, who understand the role of crofting, who understand the incredible importance of, is of people in nature. They may be harder to find because of all the other people in the movement, but they are there. I'm conscious of my time here, and I've already been through that slide. Uh, that's me and my daughter out in an um, area of common grazing. Crofting should and could be a net zero exemplar. We need to wrap crofting reform up into this debate around moving to net zero. An exemplar is not sold to the highest bidding retiree. An exemplar is not one of seven inherited crofts. It's not the status quo. To move to net zero, crofting will have to undergo reform. We may as well deliver good crofting reform to get to, well, we reform crofting to get to net zero. Um, we need to understand that getting crofts into the hands of new young people who are going to maybe manage those ways, manage those crofts in an innovative way towards net zero, it's going to be regulatory, but there's also going to be personal choices involved there. And people need to take a risk, albeit that risk can be mitigated against. And again, I think crofting, this is a very personal opinion, I think crofting reform is much needed as society moves to net zero. So, on to the questions. The first of which is net zero is going to bring around changes to crofting, whether we like it or not. How can crofting benefit from these changes? And then we'll answer this for half an hour or so and move on. <coughs> The second is around crofting reform. What does reform look like to crofting to deliver for net zero? There's a bonus question, maybe this table was the one I think, whether this is evolution or revolution. Everybody quite happy?